let's talk about an IT company that people hate even more than Facebook. Um, so I'm glad to be here. I'm Jake Lancaster, and um, I am a board certified internal medicine physician, continue to practice, as well as uh, board certified in clinical informatics, which I'll talk about in more detail as we go through. I trained here in Birmingham at UAB before going on to Vanderbilt to do a fellowship in, in informatics. And like I said, I'm the CMIO at Baptist, and most of you probably don't even know what a CMIO is, so we'll go through that uh, throughout the presentation as well. But chiefly, my main goal is to try to bridge the gap between the clinical world and the IT world. So I have no disclosures. I do not work for Epic or Cerner, um, but I will be talking about them a good deal. Um, it, just for my sake, a show of hands in the room, who uses an electronic health record right now? Does everybody use one, or is anybody still on paper? A few still on paper, okay. And then do you work for large practices, and you work for a hospital system, or solo practitioners? Solo, okay. So, thank you for that. So I want to start with a quote by Mark Andreessen, the founder of Netscape. Um, this was in the early, 90s, but uh, he said, the spread of computers and the internet will put jobs in two categories, people who tell computers what to do and people who are told by computers what to do. Uh, what he was talking about was automation and the fear going forward that a lot of your jobs are going to be lost to computers, and we'll touch on that briefly at the end. But I, I really think this dichotomy uh, makes sense today when we talk about medical practice and, and our relationship with the EHR. So here are the learning objectives, and I'll do my best to go through each of these throughout the talk. So here is the definition of health IT from HHS. Um, they say health information technology involves the exchange of health information in an electronic format. Um, you know, we, the most glaring example of the way we do this is with the EHR, but this can be your radiology systems, your cardiology systems, you know, Accelera your telemetry, your patient portals, your um, secure messaging, your um, drag and dictation systems, all those things would fall under this category. They then go on to say how they're all gonna solve world peace, um, but we'll hopefully hit on why during this presentation how uh, that is not the case and what are some of the pitfalls that we've run into and why. So I wanted to just start with what the health IT system looks like, the, or, the department looks like at a large organization. Uh, what I was struck when I was a fellow at Vanderbilt was just how many individuals worked in health IT. Uh, I thought it was a handful of people in a back room that was managing the system. No, it's 300, 400 people. Um, that's how many we have at, at, at Baptist as well. Um, managing these systems on a day-to-day -day basis, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, really trying to make them better and improve them for you. So at the top, you have your chief information officer who reports to the CEO. And underneath the CIO, you really have two areas. You have the hardware side, which is your PCs, your printers, your um, security, as well as your network. And then you also have the application side or your software side. And that's the side we'll spend the most time on. This is where you interact with the most. Um, you have several different categories. You have your clinical applications. This is your EHR. This is your drag and dictation, things like that. And you also have your business applications. This is everything from email um, to reporting, um, as well as your HR systems, if, you, if your organization has one of those. Um, training also will fall under this. To manage all the multiple projects that they have going at any time, you have something called the Project Management Office, the PMO. And so that is a, again, just a, a large group of people trying to make sure that projects get done on time. So within the clinical application, you will usually have one person who has a team under him or her that's dedicated to the electronic health record, the HR director. This person will report directly to the chief information officer. And they break down the the EHR kind of in several different pieces. So you have the inpatient side and the outpatient side. Um, usually they'll break out pharmacy, uh, radiology, and, and lab as well. But underneath inpatient and outpatient, you may also have teams of analysts working on orders and clinical documentation and lab. 
on the outpatient side, you may have people uh, working on the patient portal, just a team of analysts doing this. And so the reason I'm showing you all this is I just wanted to, for everybody to be on the same page about how large and complex this organization is. So when you say the HR is not working for me and I would like something to fix, or, or, and I send this into a black box to the help desk, you know, you have 300, 400 people that are working through this problem. On top of that, the vendors, your Cerner's and Epics, have a large team of thousands of people that are, are working in health IT. Um, they will have multiple divisions with, under the CEO. I broke out the three that I interact with the most. Uh, really, my relationship starts on the client relations side of things. You will have a manager for your organization. Um, and also, you'll usually have a physician that covers several different hospitals and regions. Um, and so if I'm having a problem that my internal analysts can't solve, I will work with that, that site manager or that site physician, and they will direct me either to somebody in the technical assistance side on their operations wing. Uh, if it's something that they think they can fix internally, they may direct me to somebody if there's something that uh, we're on the forefront of and they want to develop a new product. Or if they have the product but we didn't buy it, and this happens quite often, they'll direct me to somebody in sales and try to sell us something new, which we all love. Um, but our internal analysts spend a lot of time with their technical assistance team on problems that they're unable to solve internally. So if you are wondering why it's taking them so long to get back to you with a, a solution, it's because they're going back to this company and working with them and that can take several weeks in order for that to happen. And a lot of times, you know, if, if they're not able to solve it, but they want to send it to their product development team, you know, that's, that's almost like you, you submit a, an idea to Epic or Cerner for a new product, you think it goes into a black hole, but they really do have a group of people that will sit around and review these every year and decide what they're gonna build out uh, over the next year, next cycle. So in addition to your internal uh, health IT team and your, your vendors team, you have all these external agencies that kind of um, indirectly influence the way you use your electronic health records. You have ONC, which is the Office of National Coordinator. That's who I think about when I think about our federal government's effort to improve health IT or to, to use health this is the group you would think about when you're thinking about meaningful use, promoting interoperability for their new patient paperwork initiative. That's that group. AMIA, this is the clinical informatics specialty organization. They deal a lot with patient and research and advocacy. HEMS, which I can never remember what the acronym stands for, but this is essentially a large vendor organization. So every you know, all the thousands of different companies in health IT every year will go to Orlando or Vegas where they'll put on this large show. It's a basically a sales event. Um, but if you're looking for a new product, if you're looking for an electronic health record and you don't know where to start, going there and, and talking with somebody from that group uh, would help. Um, HIMS also rates your organization based on how advanced you are in using health IT. So if you hear that somebody's like HIMS 7, that means they're, they're very advanced. Continued, you have CHIME. This is the College of Health Care Information Management Executives. This is basically the professional organization for CIOs, do a lot of advocacy. AMDIS is the professional organization for CMIOs around the country. Um, they don't do a lot other than have this nice listserv where we communicate back and forth, um, trying to help each other out over different issues. And HL7 is something that you've probably never heard of, but they are the group that works on the standards for exchange of health information. So, you know, the way our computers talk to one another, they're kind of responsible for figuring out how to do that. All right, so everybody understand how big and vast health IT can be. Now let's get into the fun part. So it's probably every week I get multiple emails with uh, articles about why doctors don't like their EHRs, everybody in the room raised their hand when they had an unpleasant experience with one. Um, this was a great article by Atul Gawande back in 2018, which we'll go through. Here is a article in JAMA about EHRs and burnout. Here's one in Health IT News where that doctor looks really unhappy with his computer. 
And here's one by Bob Walker. He was the guy that really founded the hospitalist movement, but he wrote an entire book on this, which is really good and kind of led me to where I am today as far as my career goes. But I, I kind of wanted to start with this analogy to figure out why we have such a dissatisfaction with our EHR. So just imagine you're buying a smartphone. Um, your company told you you had to. They told you to be more efficient if you bought one. Um, but And you get to keep the actual phone, but all the background, everything on it is controlled by the company. So everybody shares the same background throughout the organization. Um, you know, they decide the placement of the apps and the icons. They decide who has access to various apps and icons, even though everybody can see all of the icons, and decide what pages it's gonna be on. Um, they've customized, and yes, you're not allowed to rearrange your icons either. You've customized the content specifically for your organization, which is great. It makes it maybe a little bit easier to use, but then it also means you can't update your phone when that new upgrade comes around over the next year because it will mess up some of the content that you already created. Um, and then you also have these numerous external agencies that also define how you can use your phone. And then before you actually use it, before you make a call, you have to review different apps that are on multiple different pages. Um, they're not all in one spot. And when you do finally make the call, the call drops. And after the call, then you have to go to the notes section and type with your two thumbs um, everything that occurred in order to get paid. And if you want to share that note, you have to print it out and fax it. And you can see how that can get pretty difficult to do. And you can see that that smartphone, even if it's an Apple or, or an Android, resembles nothing that the actual vendor um, designed and made for you. So because of your a lot of your own internal decisions and these regulations, the end product is very clunky. And I think that's a lot of what has happened with some of our EHRs. Here is, I'll let you look through this slide, but this is commonly shown. Um, it's kind of like the telephone game where you put in your request for what you want, and then it goes through all the different members on the IT team and you know what they actually uh, understand your request to be. Um, and at the end, really, you just needed a tire swing, but they built you you know, something that's non-functional. All right, so what do these articles say about why doctors hate their computers? Um, everybody's experienced all of this. You spend about two hours on your doing computer work for every hour that you spend seeing a patient. You know, the rise of EHRs corresponds to the rising level of burnout and depression. You work more hours after um, clinic on the computer when you should be spending time with your families. Um, there's this interference with the doctor and patient relationship. You have this extra device in the room that your eyes are going to. Um, and then especially when you're implementing these machines for the first time, there's a very high expense due to loss of productivity. You have to decrease your census in order to put them in. And that's the, the actual largest expense for the EHR as opposed to licensing fees, that initial decrease in productivity. So when you hear that, you know, partners spend a billion dollars on their EHR, is really that loss of productivity they're talking about. There's this concept called revenge of the ancillaries, which I'll talk about. Um, I'll let you think about what, what that means. And then here's something to think about. So there's an older generations of physicians who did not grow up really with computers uh, when they were younger. And I'll give the example of my, my boss. Uh, he was doing his MBA in 2012, and they asked him to write an essay using Microsoft Word. He never used Microsoft Word before. He dictates his essay. FedEx is it to his secretary. She types it up and sends it in for him. He was then asked to do a PowerPoint presentation. This is an OBGYN. He practiced for 35 years. PowerPoint presentation. Never used PowerPoint. Draws out a picture of it. Sends it to his secretary. She makes it for him. And he sends it in. And this is a large group of people that we're asking to adopt these electronic health record systems. And their interfaces are not as good as Microsoft Word and PowerPoint, even though you know those are not the best things out there either. So you have that group of physicians that is going to struggle no matter what it is, no matter how much training they get. So what's the revenge of the ancillaries? So when you think about ancillary staff, you know, your, your nursing staff, your physical therapists, um, lab, radiology, um, 
and then you think about implementing these EHRs. And so what you do is you have these design sessions for how you want your workflows to be set up. And the people that schedules permit them to make it to these meetings are your ancillary staff. And so inevitably during these meetings, you know, maybe there'll be one doctor show up, maybe there will be zero. Um, but if they do show up, they'll be outnumbered 10 to one. And then you'll have, you know, you're designing a power plan or an order set and they're asking you, and then, you know, the lab tech or the radiology, radiology tech wants you to put the indication in, in this drop down menu. They want you to build out this extra checkbox. They want you to build out, you know, this extra documentation form. Quality wants you to add this to your documentation form so that it's much easier for them to collect the data on the back end as opposed to what they were used to, which is uh, combing through you know, your text looking for the reasons or, or calling you or figuring it out using their clinical judgment. So because of those additional extra checks, extra drop down menus, that has caused a lot of dissatisfaction with, with uh, the EHRs. And that's not the vendor's fault. That is you know, another on goal. And once those things are in, it is really hard to undo, unfortunately. Um, what are some other things? This is the Croft article that looks specifically at EHRs and burnout. So some of the things it found that was directly correlated with the burnout was information overload. In the paper world, you're kind of limited to what's in front of you. Uh, in the EHR world, you have data you know, can going back 10, 20 years on your patient. You have a lot more lab data, imaging data that's much richer. You have you know, all these external documents coming in from outside sources that you can look through and are expected to look through, and that just adds a high cognitive load to the physician. You have sometimes some slow system response times. Remember when I talked about not being able to take regular upgrades? And again, none of the physicians like to take regular upgrades either because it means downtime. So the lack of upgrades means you get these crashes or slow systems response time. So when you're going to write a note and you go to sign it and your system crashes and you lose that note, that's not enjoyable for anybody. Excessive data entry, that kind of harkens back to that revenge of the ancillaries I was talking about. The inability to navigate the system quickly. Um, most of these systems are designed and you look at them, they have 50 tabs everywhere just information all over the page. You can't go to a website anywhere and see something that messy, um, but your EHR looks like that. But by the way, when you go to the, see the vendor demo, there are not that many tabs. Most of those were added internally um, at your organization. Um, note bloat. Has everybody heard that the size of our notes, the total length of the note has doubled since 2008? And that is a US phenomenon. It is not happening in other countries, likely due to the way uh, our regulation systems are going on. Again, this interference with the patient-clinician relationship is um, a source of burnout. This fear of missing something in the note um, or missing something in the chart. When you have a complex patient that's come in and has had five or six different visits over the past year and they have thousands of notes that you could wade through, you're gonna, you feel like there's something missing and you don't know how to get it. And then there's this general uh, notion that all these notes were geared towards billing that uh, also drives a lot of burnout. Most people hear outpatient, inpatient, a little of both, a little of both maybe. So some outpatient specific issues that cause a lot of dissatisfaction are the, the problem list. What the problem list? You know, we had the past medical history. Where did this come from? That was an EHR kind of generated idea. And it, if you see these things, they can get massive. And you'll have a patient who's had sore throat on their problem list for you know, three years. Because you know, whose job is it to keep an update and maintain it? What are you supposed to do with these things? They're unwieldy and cause a lot of uh, frustration. Quality programs, anybody participating in an ACO, patient-centered medical home, anybody, everybody's doing MIPS, really. All of these things add different um, documentation requirements, add different things that you have to do with your EHR, and just increases the, the workload. The message centers, uh, who has you know, more than 50 unread 
inbox messages right now. Yeah, yeah a lot of people. Yeah, just dreading going in and signing in the next morning is going to be huge. Um, you know, that didn't really exist in the paper world, right? You had your phone calls, you had some, you know, your faxes and other things, but you didn't really get all these additional FYI results that kept coming in. So that is a major source of dissatisfaction. And then the last thing, especially for outpatient clinics um, that were on paper before, you, you had a lot of fluidity of what your nurse or MA could do that they're not able to do in the EHR because of either privileging or security. Um, you know, it's out of scope for their practice. And so once you switch from paper to um, the EHR because of different rules for your organization, you know, you find that your nurse or MA is not quite as useful as they used to be and you have to pick up a lot of that slack. Another piece in that Croft article was uh, a concept called quiet dark versus loud bright. So it would not be a good healthcare talk if we didn't talk to the aviation industry. Um, but in aviation, they have this concept of quiet dark where information is not displayed until something goes wrong or needs attention. So by default, things are off. Things, indicator lights are off in normal circumstances. In medicine, it's the opposite. We like everything to be loud and bright all the time. And instead of dark, you know, regular red, you're gonna have dark red for your critical results. Um, but it's really hard to tell the difference in what's important at that moment and what is not. So you could have you know, normal vital signs and abnormal vital signs only look slightly different. You know, your abnormal chloride looks the same as your abnormal potassium and so on and so forth. So really not a good use of our information in the EHR. And then I wanted to end kind of the dissatisfaction section with this quote from Fred Brooks, The Mythical Man Month. This is, uh, he wrote a lot of essays on software programming, but I think it sums up some of our dissatisfaction. So, no scene from prehistory is quite so vivid as that of the mortal struggles of great beasts in the tar pits. In the mind's eye, one sees dinosaurs, mammoths, and saber-toothed tigers struggling against the grip of the tar. The fiercer the struggle, the more entangling the tar, and no beast is so strong or so skillful that he ultimately sinks. Large system programming has over the past decade been such a tar pit, and many great and powerful beasts have thrashed violently in it. Most have emerged with running systems, few have met goals, schedules, and budgets. Large and small, massive or wiry, team after team has become entangled in the tar. No one thing, no one thing seems to cause the difficulty. Any particular paw can be pulled away. But the accumulation of simultaneous and interacting factors brings slower and slower motion. Everyone seems to have been surprised by the stickiness of the problem, and it is hard to discern the nature of it. But we must try to understand it if we are able to solve it. <coughs> this was not written recently. This is, you know, 70s and 80s. Talking about large systems, and once you have multiple committees involved, multiple groups of people doing the development, how things, uh, nothing, no large glaring problem is causing it. It's accumulation of many, many small things. So are there any upsides to health IT and, and EHRs? Yes, I believe so. This is a good Journal of Hospital Medicine article called the IEHR, which is a rebuttal, uh, essentially, of Atul Gawande's article um, talking about how, how it's not always the, the EHR's fault. Some of these things, again, like I said, are on goals. So what are the upsides? You know, some were apparent from day one I remember as a third year medical student, we were on paper, um, I could, one of my jobs was to go get the chart prior to rounds. I would go fight the nurse and grab the chart and bring it to the physician. It was great. I felt great. I had done my job. Um, I was useful. You know, the day we switched to Epic, uh, my fourth year, uh, all of a sudden that, that skill went away. You know, now you can access the chart from anywhere in the country, you know, on your phone, on your iPad. I, once placed orders on a patient while I was in China. I would have liked to have been on vacation, but I got that message center message and it looked like they really needed it, so I went ahead and did it. Um, the legibility of notes, um, I think everybody can agree, it is nice to be able to read what the specialist actually said about the patient. Um, that was a huge ordeal and orders. You can now tell if that was a decimal point or you know 
not, or just a speck of dust. And so you don't give the patient 10 milligrams of morphine instead of one. Uh, chart search, this is an underutilized feature of most EHRs, but it's there. If you want to find something, if you want to know before you order another ANA that the patient had one three years ago, you can do that fairly easily. Uh, data collection, um, this is maybe the upside of the revenge of the ancillaries. Um, they, you can extract data from it sometimes pretty easily. Um, improved care coordination, uh, now that we have fairly robust some health information exchanges, you can really uh, help kind of close those referral loops in a much better way. A big one that people cite all the time is uh, CPOE has reduced medication errors by 55%. Um, again, this goes back to a lot of that legibility of the order um, and somewhat to some of these alerts that you get when you try to order a, you know, a medication on a patient that has a anaphylaxis to it, but it has reduced medication errors by 55%. That alone has, is a good reason to, to move to health IT. And then I think that over the past two decades, it is probably almost impossible to comply completely with all the new regulations um, and laws out there without an electronic health record. It's just getting way too complex. And it's over the next two years, it's even gonna be more so. All right, upside continued, the ability to make changes at scale. Um, so, you know, these organizations that are doing value-based care and uh, everybody's moving to that for, um, so they say, you know, you really wanna make sure that you can, you can make some of those changes at scale so you can affect the clinical practice of your organization. And people have done that and we'll go through a couple of examples. Uh, health information exchange, I talked about a little bit. Um, with Care Quality and Commonwealth, these are two of the big organizations that are now, if your EHR is probably participating in, you can share records and see records from a lot of the clinics that are not on your system. Increased revenue, these systems were built as billing systems. They are really good at collecting the dollars that you need and that you deserve. The ability to con conduct research. So you've collected all this data, um, all these academic centers can do a good, better job of conducting research now. And I don't think we've really seen the benefits of this yet. I think that'll come in the next 10, 20 years. And then increased adherence to evidence-based evidence guidelines. So you know, this is just a handful of things that they've shown EHRs have helped with, improved rates of immunizations, improved VD prophylaxis, improved hypertension treatment, and reduction in redundant testing. So there's, there's multiple different areas where the EHR can be used to improve clinical care. So where do we go from here? Obviously, there's some huge dissatisfaction. There's some upside. How can we make them better? And can we? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about informatics. For those of you, does anybody know what informatics is? Kind of, not really. Informatics, so this is applied information science. Um, this is the group that tries to make your IT systems better, is the way I would think of it. It is the human part that goes out and tries to be the bridge between IT and, and the clinician. Um, within informatics, there are several different subgroups. Um, there's translational biomedical informatics. This is more the bench um, side of things, trying to get genomics and things up and running. Um, clinical research informatics is kind of what it sounds like. Clinical informatics is what I'll talk about the most, but you also have consumer, which is focused on the patient, and public health, which is focused on some of your uh, surveillance and reporting. Clinical informatics, this is a new ACGME approved specialty. Did anybody know that? A few, okay. Um, so yes, in 2014, it was approved as an ACGME approved specialty. Essentially, they're saying that it's the subspecialty of all medical specialties um, that is supposed to help informatics and information technology deliver healthcare services. And their kind of motto is that the brain plus the computer is uh, superior to the brain by itself. So anybody that has done a residency or a fellowship in any 
any specialty can go on to do a clinical informatics specialty. There are several subgroups within clinical informatics. The physician informatics, you, you have to be a physician to do, but the rest, uh, nursing informatics, pharmacy, lab, radiology, most of these will have their own certification. Uh, most of the people that you see at your organization that are helping you are probably nurses who've done an additional uh, training in informatics. And hopefully you have maybe a couple of physicians as well. But we'll talk mostly about physician informatics. So I'm gonna go through what it is as a specialty and some of the training requirements um, for those that are interested. So it is a ACGME accredited fellowship. Um, that means um, you have all the same requirements as other specialties and fellowships and residencies. And when you're done, you get to do a board certification and pay a lot of money and then more money for maintenance of certification requirements. So everybody was very excited about that. Um, there's no direct interaction with patients by itself. Um, no services rendered. There's no billing codes or anything like that. It is similar to some of the, uh, it's actually under the American Board of Preventative Medicine. So the preventative medicine fellowships, you may have heard of those. It's kind of similar in nature to those and, and set up that way. But the patients we think about are all of our doctors that use our systems that are frustrated by it every day. So they come to me with a, a chief complaint of not being able to do X, Y, and Z, and I, that's the way I try to think about it at, with it being part of a specialty. Here's a, well, this was a up-to-date list of all the programs two years ago, but now there are 34 ACGME accredited programs. Um, when I started, there were 13 and there were three when they first started back in 2014. Stanford, um, Oregon, and I believe CHOP may have been the first three, or UIC. But there's a handful in the South now. I know UAB does not have one. Vanderbilt has one. Uh, I think Emory has one now. Um, but there's maybe 10 or more in the South now. So right now, you, there's two different ways to get to be board certified. You can do the fellowship, which is what I did, but um, if you're practicing in clinical informatics and you have maybe an advanced degree in informatics as a physician, you can still do the practice pathway until 2023. So you prove that you, know, you did 20% of your time in informatics, you can take the board exam right now. So that goes away in 2023. <coughs> And what do we do during these fellowships? Well, we do rotations like you would in GI or cardiology or anything like that. We have some that are clinically focused. We'll spend time with internal medicine, peds, surgery, et cetera. And we have some that are more technically focused. So we'll go to those groups in health IT and spend time with the HR team, the security team, the data science team, and on and so forth. You can also do some electives. You can go work with a startup company for a couple of months work with public health. I did a couple of months with the Department of Tennessee Public Health Group or work for another private hospital to gain some additional exposure. What do you learn? So you have this core content, um, but you also learn some hard skills. Uh, change management and governance is the, is the most important one that they teach and you try to learn. Um, how do you get a large group of people to start liking the EHR? You know, it's an impossible task. I don't think I'll ever be there. Um, how do you get a large group of people to do something they don't want to do? You know, it, it's, it's, that's what change management is all about. Um, but you also learn some technical skills. You'll learn SQL. This, I called this one out there because it's the only one that's tested on the board exam. This is how you manipulate uh, data sets, essentially. You learn data science, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Um, not every program has a heavy foundation in this. Um, so if you are interested, you know, and interested in that in particular, that's something you would check beforehand. <coughs> programming languages like R and Python and Swift. Anybody here know any programming languages? Yeah, so those are just a handful of ones that you'll be exposed to. Um, and then you have your EHR specific skills. So I was lucky enough to be able to do both Cerner and Epic's uh, physician, architect, and builder programs uh, where you learn how to build the order sets, the node templates, and all the alerts on the back end. And so you can talk with your techs and analysts and uh, 
really speak their language. So when they tell you that that something is not possible, you can say, yeah, actually it is. You know, I learned this while I was up in uh, Verona or Kansas City. So what do you do after a fellowship or, or after that certification? Well, there's a lot of different pathways. You can go on to be a chief medical information officer. You can be a physician informaticist, go into research. You can work for a vendor. So like I said, each vendor will have multiple physicians working for them. You can work in consulting or a lot of people go to work for startup companies. And what is your role as a physician informaticist? Really, you're that facilitator. You're that bridge between your colleagues. And most, most, if not all, I would say, of physician informaticists, especially right out of fellowship, continue to practice. <coughs> Some, as they get older, they decide to stop, or their administrative work gets uh, too laborious that they stop. But I still practice, and a lot of us still practice. So you're that intermediary between the clinical practice what's working, what's not, and the IT staff. Um, you are able to go to those meetings, so I have a lot of time blocked out throughout my day where I can go sit in these 10 a.m. meetings where everybody else is in clinic, and when somebody from the ancillary side says we need to add this checkbox, I can say, wait a second, let's, let's think about that for a second. Is there another way we can do it? Uh, we help streamline and refine our solutions. We communicate the upcoming changes to the medical staff. And uh, we try to work with the analyst to make sure that the request that came in is what was delivered. Um, we are not the HIM police. I do not go to the doctors and say you need to finish your discharge summaries, even though they will ask you to do those sorts of things. And that I draw the line and say, nope, that's not why I'm here. I want to make friends. Um, and you don't make all the decisions about the EHR in a vacuum. And so this has probably happened at a lot of organizations where you will have one doctor who is the IT doctor who decides this is how we're going to build our sepsis order set. Doesn't matter what everybody else in the organization wants. This one doctor, because he's in that spot, has decided this is how it's going to be. That's how it is in a lot of places. And we'll go through and I'll show you kind of how we talk about decision making and governance in just a second, but that's not how it should be. So, what does a chief medical information officer do? Um, still a physician informaticist. They kind of um, are higher up in the food chain. We work with the administration at the higher level to make sure that some of the issues related to the EHR are brought to their attention, especially as they relate to burnout and things like that. Um, we help the physicians understand the changes again um, and mitigate any of those unwanted changes. We look at a lot of data. So all these systems have this data on how efficient your physicians are. So yeah, I can compare Dr. X to Dr. Y in an ambulatory setting and say, you know, he's spending 20% more time in notes than he, he is. What is he doing wrong or what's he doing differently? And how can I help? And, uh, you know, we'd like to be looking at ways to correlate that between their quality scores and different things like that. But we try to do that. We also look at alerts, which ones are effective, which ones are being fired and everybody's ignoring 100% of the time so we can get rid of some of those. Um, and then we're kind of responsible for setting up that governance structure for making decisions and setting the strategy for where we want to go as an organization uh, from an IT side. So how do you handle issues as a physician, physician informaticist? Or as a physician that's practicing? Um, well, you know, like I said before, you're not going to make a decision on how to treat a patient based on their chief complaint alone. You really got to take a good history. So it's really up to us to understand what the actual problem is. Um, you know, if somebody is saying that this order set is not working, I can't just go in and fix the order set. I really got to understand what your issues are with it. And then I try to make everybody understand that there are no quick fixes. You know, if you have a 300 pound patient, with diabetes that you would like them to lose weight, you know, that's not gonna happen overnight. These fixes are kind of the same thing. Most of these projects take several months to years to, to finish. And uh, it's difficult for the practicing physician to understand, but a lot of it has to do with how large and complex that health IT organization is, all the different stakeholders there are, uh, and that back and forth process that can take a while and testing and testing and testing to make sure that your fix does not cause a disruption to somebody downstream. The downstream consequences, that's what I was talking about. If you make decisions in a vacuum, uh, if I say, if 
Dr. X says, I want this added to my order set or to the order set for the system, uh, you really have to think about how it's gonna affect everything else downstream, and that takes time. And then, again, you always have to ask, is this the right thing to do for the patient? We can do a lot of things with the EHR. You know, if we wanted to have our environmental services team be able to place orders for TPA, we could do that, you know, but we're not gonna do that, um, hopefully. So, and also, some things will get asked that don't necessarily meet regulatory requirements, so we're not gonna do anything that's illegal. So those are, legal is involved in a lot of these discussions, and as you may know in other endeavors, that can take some time. What levels of intervention are there? So, you know, we have our patient that we're treating with their problem. Um, you can intervene at the personal level. This is the easiest. Um, we'll do this a lot with that provider efficiency data. If, they, if they're having a tough time and we can see that based on, on their data compared to their peers, we'll work with them to create, you know, macros and filters and smart techs. Um, we'll get them set up with drag and dictation. We'll get them set up um, with some additional training and help um, to make them a little bit more efficient. Um, if a group of doctors at the specialty level came together and said, we would like our order set change, you can intervene at that level. Won't affect any of the, if you do it for cardiology, it may not affect anybody in GI or other specialties, but you can configure your systems at that level. You can build them out their own dashboard. You can do it at the facility level. Maybe one of your hospitals doesn't have a certain medication, so you remove that from the order set or you hide it. And then you can do things at the system level. This is kind of the majority of requests. Some things, just because of the way the EHRs are built, you cannot do at a microscopic level, so you have to do it at the system level. And so this is where things slow down, and you really have to go through all your governance. And then there's the vendor. Um, you know, you're not able to do something as a system, so what do you do? You reach out to the vendor and see if they can help. <coughs> and then they'll have to release it, usually in their next upgrade. So decision-making and governance, like I said, do not make decisions in a vacuum. You really need a multidisciplinary group of physicians involved in making those decisions, and you need to compensate them for their time away from their practice or in their off time. You need to have a regular meeting cadence um, so that things don't get forgotten or you get sloppy. And you should try to align it and mesh with your other other governance structures um, like your MEC or your PNT. Does anybody have a physician advisory council or something like that at their organization that they're aware of and they know how to contact? Nobody? You? All right. So examples of just the hierarchy. Um, so usually this will, this will vary, but at the top you'll have your chief medical officer who your CMIO will report to. Also we'll have a dotted line over the CIO and then physician informaticists that kind of aggregate and communicate with the CMIO. This is our governance structure for how we make decisions. Uh, this is, the names will vary depending on where you are, but it's probably fairly similar. Um, so at the top, we have what's called our Clinical Standards Council. Um, this is a group that meets quarterly, and so Usually they are not the group that handles the day-to-day -day requests, but if there's something that goes against a standard that we've set for the organization, like how we treat sepsis or how we treat a heart attack, um, and that if one physician is making a request for that to change, then it needs to be reviewed from this group and they go through all the evidence for it. Below them, we have our clinical content committee, and this is the group that handles more of the day-to-day -day requests a group of multidisciplinary doctors from all over our system. We have 22 hospitals, um, so we have to try to get good representation from those hospitals as well as multiple specialties on this group. And they will, paid for their time, they will go through these requests every month to decide if it's something we want to turn on or not um, and how it will affect the group. Where do these requests come from? It can come from ind individuals. It can come out of a working group, so if we have a COPD working group and they make some suggestions for our, our order set, we can funnel up through them. And it can come from the service line. So our GI service lines, oncology, cardiology uh, can do the same. And you can have a similar structure on the outpatient setting as well. In conjunction with that, there's usually a physician advisory group or council. Um, this, they're not involved in the day-to-day 
timely making decisions on what changes need to be made, but they're more of the overall strategy of changes that are coming um, for the group. Again, made up of many different doctors from the many different specialties across the system. You also have representation from nursing, IT lab, security administration, kind of facilitating this group. This is kind of bi-directional feedback, a lot of this is. So upcoming upgrades, upcoming changes that we're looking to push out, we'll take to this group, get their feedback, and then they're also responsible for communicating that back out to their peers. In addition to the numerous emails that immediately get deleted that I sent. All right, so I think one of their um, requirements for this was that I present a case. So here's the case that I'm gonna go through. Uh, chief complaint is I cannot get through an admission without four or five pop-up alerts. So um, you get a little bit more history as the physician informaticist. Every time admit orders are placed, multiple alerts for lab duplicates, imaging duplicates, drug-drug interactions, and drug allergies pop up. Anybody ever had this happen to them? Just, just one, okay. Um, so I do my physical exam, I go in and I actually recreate this workflow um, and I see the same um, alerts for maybe a duplicate CBC, even though I ordered it um, 24 hours later. Um, I do a workup, you know, I do my advanced testing, I run my reports in the background and see the number of alerts that we have in our system that are being overridden and see that this is one of the top ones. And so I come up with a diagnosis. Status informaticus. Come on, you know, I know it's late on a Friday afternoon, but that, that's not a real diagnosis, guys. So how do you treat this? Well, um, like I said, we formed this best practice committee on alerts. And from, I don't turn it off myself. I would get a group together to look at this and, and decide, you know, including pathology and lab, to look at this and decide if we, if we relax this alert, what will happen? What will be the downstream consequences? And go from there. So what can you do in your practice, uh, informatics related? Well, you really, if you don't know who your physician liaison is, you need to find one uh, or create one. It could be you, um, if it does not already exist. Ensure that that person has some dedicated time that they're compensated for, that they can work with the analysts on continuous improvement. If you're participating in MIPS or any of these organizations that require some continuous practice improvement, you know, that, that's something you're being graded on now. So you can justify having this 10% or 20% of this person's time being spent towards this. Um, and you need to work with this person to get your change request funneled to the right people. Remember how complex health IT is. Getting it to the right person at the right time is hard and then learn from them. They will become the expert in how the new workflows and changes are that are coming down throughout the system. Learn to personalize your system. Um, learn to create those macros and, and shortcuts because they will save you all that pajama time that, that we talked about before. And try to stay informed about updates and retrain periodically for continuous improvement so that you are not the person that is being told by the computer what to do. All right, if we have time, I'm gonna go briefly through some future directions with the EHR. So we talked about our voice assistance earlier, so it was great that we had that in the marketing talk, um, but this is coming to the EHR. So I've seen demos from both Cerner and Epic, uh, and this is the announcement from Epic in 2018 with this, their partnership with Nuance, um, where you can actually ask, you can say, hey Epic, order a CBC, and it'll key up the orders. Um, their goal and what they're trying to do is have something like a virtual scribe in the background where it will document the entire note after you have your conversation with the patient. Uh, they showed it at their conference in August, looks great, probably five to 10 years out, but um, it would be great when it happens. But again, you're gonna have a camera and a uh, recorder in the room or a microphone in the room with these patients. So. Artificial intelligence, shout out to Skynet up there. Both Epic and Cerner have a lot of modules already that utilize artificial intelligence. Not, not the you know, replacing doctor sort of stuff yet, um, but this is some better you know, predictive, predictive models for readmissions and no-shows and sepsis. Um, Cerner has some that will read your note and suggest diagnoses and also suggest your level of service code. So kind of fancy. 
Um, there's this movement to the clouds. You know, everybody's trying to move to the cloud. Cerner and Epic are not built off the cloud, um, but they're trying to get there. They know that browser-based solutions are a little bit uh, more friendly, you know, require less maintenance. Um, so they're all trying to do that. So Cerner announced this partnership with Amazon over the summer uh, where they're hoping to do that. And they'll also increase their ability to do some of that artificial intelligence. Third-party applications. So think of the iTunes store on your phone. Um, this is already here for EHR. Most people do not know about it, but um, Epic has the App Orchard. Cerner has its own version. Um, all the others, I believe, have them as well. Um, where you, there are third-party apps that are a little bit easier to integrate into your system um, through this smart on fire type system. And that, that was, there's a lot of hype about that a couple of years ago, but there's been a recent law passed um, talking specifically about these APIs that I think will spread this on a little bit more. Access to data. Anybody know what the 21st Century Cures Act is and information blocking? Yes. So. The, actually, the final rule on what information blocking means is expected to come out over the next couple of months. Um, but essentially, this is trying to open up the EHR and have more data flow out in an easier way, uh, which is great for sharing information with your colleagues. Um, but it also means that all that data is going to go to the patient portal um, in near real time. Um, that is one of the things that they call out. And people think that you're not going to be able to wait seven days to release the labs or release the imaging or your notes. It's, it's all expected to go in near real time. Coming soon. Um, CMS.gov has been working on uh, reduction in regulation over the past couple of years. Their patients over paperwork initiative, these, you know, the streamlining, streamlining of E&M codes is one of the things they've been talking about that I thought I would mention. Um, and those are just a handful of things that are coming. One of the things I did not mention was, and that I should, was the partnership that a lot of organizations have where they can basically provide the services of the EHR for individual practicing clinicians' clinics. So Epic has Epic Connect, Cerner has its own thing, where essentially you can, instead of going to Epic and buying the system, you go to uh, St. Vincent's or UAB, and they will provide the services and implement it for you, and you'll be on the same version as them. So one of the key takeaways from this talk, one, health IT is large and complex, and that if you feel like you things are getting lost, it's because of that complexity. Um, the issues with our EHRs are multifactorial. A lot of it is created internally because of our processes that we put in place. There are still many upsides to the EHR, and that clinical informatics can be that bridge to help drive improvement in, in health IT. And one thing I will also put out, push out is be nice to these people in clinical informatics. If, if you're the physician that, I had a, an email yesterday that came to the help desk that said, I need somebody to call me so I can make changes to the stroke order set. If they are not able to, if the person that calls is not able to make changes immediately to this order set, they are wasting my time. So this analyst that got that email, what do you think they did with it? Well, they gave it to me, but also they have 5,000 other requests that are coming in. They're not going to want to deal with that person that's being really hard on them. So be nice to these people. Their entire job is trying to make it better for you. Um, but you know, preaching the choir, I guess. And then again, the landscape of health IT is rapidly evolving and everybody needs to keep up as much as they can.